Okay, now can you hear me? Yeah. You can? Good. Oh, yeah, okay. All right. Hi, I'm Amy Hendrickson. I am standing in for David Brower today. You were probably expecting to see him, but um, he couldn't be here. He'll be here for the rest of the sessions. Today we have uh, Phil Harrington. He thinks of himself as an amateur biblical scholar. However, he does have some bona fide degrees, and he will tell you about those in a little while. So I'm excited to hear this topic, and I'll turn it over to Phil. Okay. I'm going to take off my glasses and hopefully that will make this you can't wear everything all at once you're in trouble um, welcome i am very glad that you are able to join me um, on this what i call a journey a literary journey into uh, one of the nuances of the gospel of mark and um, by way of introduction uh, i want to talk about um, the title and uh, particularly that question mark there, that question mark at the end of the title, um, and also about what I mean by an amateur uh, biblical scholar. And that, um, that should give you a little bit more of an idea about uh, the nature of this journey uh, that you're joining me on. Uh, my working title was just simply the woman uh, who wrote the uh, Gospel of Mark. Um, but I fully intended to ditch that title so that I wouldn't have to put the disclaimer on that hopefully you read when you read the course description, um, that we are not going to be talking about who actually wrote the Gospel of Mark. Um, uh, but I had used that as an attention-getting device. Um, and decided that was that was too much. I didn't want to mislead people. But the Humanities Committee um, uh, didn't like any of my alternative titles better. <laughs> so we compromised by putting that, uh, that question mark there on the end. Um, and I decided eventually that that was really um, inspired. <laughs> that question mark really hits the point because what we're going to do is look at the question not of who wrote the Gospel of Mark. We don't know, um, and we will never know who wrote the Gospel of the Mark, but we will be looking, investigating, evaluating the question of how, um, how crazy of a notion would that be? Because it is a notion that came to me uh, a few years ago. I found myself thinking, boy, it's almost as if a woman wrote this Gospel. Um, and so what I want to do um, maybe with your help, hopefully, is to evaluate how absurd that thought was in my mind. So we won't be answering the question of could a woman have written the gospel? In all probability, that's not very likely. But is there enough reason in the text to suspect that someone at least wrote it who had a strong concern for the role of women in the early church? at the time when the gospel was written, around 70 AD. Um, and somebody who may have been concerned about the fact that role that women had in the church was eroding or being uh, threatened. So there is also um, uh, a typo that I want to call your attention to, because some of you may have seen on one of the, the, the lists on the calendar, it presented this way, the women who wrote the Gospel of the Mark, when I asked Gospel of Mark, when I saw that, I thought, oh no, <laughs> um, I hope people aren't going to be asking me about who these women were <laughs> who wrote the Gospel of Mark. I am willing to take responsibility for one fictitious author, but not a whole slew of them. <laughs> so um, I also probably um, will find myself referring to Mark. Um, uh, as the, the author of the gospel, just because we're so accustomed to that. 
And according to tradition, that's the name associated with the gospel. We don't know for sure who, who the Mark was that was thought to have written it, but um, uh, I don't want to keep saying this gospel all the time. So I may, that, I may slip up. When I do say Mark, put parentheses on it, because um, for one thing, we don't know uh, if somebody named Mark wrote it. That name did not appear on the gospel until 100 years later. The author of this gospel um, chose to be anonymous. Um, the name Mark got attached to it later, and there was a person by the name Papias who thought he knew who that Mark was, John Mark, who had uh, been associated with the, the Apostle Peter. Um, but Papias was kind of notorious for being unreliable. <laughs> he liked to invent things, or he liked to, just to, to repeat rumors. Um, as if they were a fact. We can see that in his record, so that um, it's not, it's best to assume that, uh, it's best to, like the author wanted, uh, let the author remain anonymous. Um, uh, we will be looking at um, uh, today just one story that's on printed on your handout, um, and then putting that story in context the next week, and then finally, uh, addressing this question of how what we find, how does that play into a possible purpose for the Gospel of Mark? Um, however, I do want to um, I do want to to let you know what I mean by an amateur biblical scholar. Um, and to do that, I want you to imagine on this wall over here a big sign that says academia, <laughs> and then. On this wall over here, a big sign that says church. <laughs> These are the two, or two of the major sources, spheres, arenas in which biblical scholarship takes place. There are more, <laughs> and I have separated them on purpose. They, they aren't totally separated. They relate to each other. Most of the people who work over here in academia on um, biblical texts are working in institutions that are set up to help the people over here. So they are related, um, but there are strong differences too. Um, there are purposes that are different. There are goals that are different, and there are techniques that are different. And, and that's probably as it should be. Um, uh, I have spent um, the last 30 years of my life over here <laughs> in this sphere of, of the church. Um, and I would consider myself a professional over there. But over here, I still like to refer to myself as a, an amateur. And that's not to discredit myself. That's not to disparage amateurs, because an amateur is somebody who does something for the love of it. And I think we need more amateur biblical scholars. Uh, it should not all be left to, up to professionals over here or over here. Um, and I think that's that we all benefit. Uh, and, and that's what HASP is about, right? Um, now that we are now that we are retired, <laughs> we can turn our attention to some of the things that have captivated us, captivated us all of our lives, um, and we have the right to do that, to pursue that. We can't ever go back. I can't ever get the professional degrees over here. I can't learn Greek and Hebrew the way that these folks over here in academia have mastered it uh, at this stage of my life. Um, but that is no reason to keep me away from engaging in that. And I am in this looking at the Gospel of Mark, um, pursuing an interest, a strong interest that I had ever since I was in seminary in the, well, actually beginning in the late 70s, but most of my seminary, uh, my five years in seminary were in the beginning of the 80s. Um, and some of my interests have been put on the burner while I've been preoccupied over here, and I'm trying to resurrect some of them um, right now. Notice, though, that, that one of the differences is that speculation is much more permissible over here. And particularly on the last session, we get into that area of speculation um, so that uh, we're not going for certainty. I also talk about this differences because um, I don't want you to hold me accountable for over here. I'm stepping over into this, <laughs> this range right over here. So don't me hold me accountable for your faith. Um, Smart audio glasses with Alexa. Can you tell which? Okay. Um, over here, I took responsibility for helping people in their spiritual growth. 
and that's not my purpose um, for these classes. So if I say anything that 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 sounds strange to what you believe in this sphere of your life, don't hold me accountable for it. <laughs> and if you hold me accountable over here, do it gently. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> um, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, I will address that. I won't take time to, to always stop and address it, but that's that's something that I had intended to mention. Um, you're right. Uh, what she was talking about is sometimes an antagonism from folks over here about the folks over here. Um, they're they're not aloof. They're they're aloof. They're they're not connected enough to where real people are and real faith is. And they get carried away on things that aren't important, et cetera, like that. They, they, they get too high and mighty, whatever. Um, and I am not one of those persons who look disparagingly at these folks <laughs> and academia. I don't always agree with some of the way they do things. Uh, I don't understand some of the way they do things. Um, but they don't always, they don't agree with each other either. Um, there are, uh, Gospel of Mark is the smallest gospel. And for a long time, until, until relatively recently, it was the neglected gospel. No one bothered with the gospel of Mark because everything in gospel of Mark, almost everything in the gospel of Mark, you can find in Matthew or Luke. So people thought it was an abbreviation. We now believe that it was not an abbreviation, that it was indeed the first gospel. And for other reasons that we'll get into tomorrow, it's become the, the most studied uh, gospel. Um, and so, Western Theological Seminary, which has a modest, very modest um, library, um, uh, and has already made that change to, to go in with mostly electronic things, that you can still go over there and find somewhere between 50 and 60 linear feet of books on the Gospel of Mark. <laughs> and most of those, those books do not agree with each other. Uh, and that's the whole purpose over here. You, you, put out a, you put out a speculative idea something you strongly believe in, you try to prove it, you know, and people react to it, uh, and they like that. Um, so there's a bit of antagonism over here, but mostly in the friendly sense. <laughs> um, anyway, good, uh, good point. Um, yes, I am not doing this as someone who considers the, these folks have, have done us a great service by dedicating their lives to the original languages and to reading all of those 50 to 60 linear feet of books um, that you have to do to be a good professional. So, um, but let's get into uh, the story uh, for today, uh, the anointing of Jesus by an anonymous woman. And um, you will find that on the one side of your um, handout. While Jesus was at Bethany, in the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very costly ointment of nard. And she broke open the jar and poured the ointment on his head. But some were there who said to one another in anger, why was the ointment wasted in this way? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii, and the money given to the poor, and they scolded her. But Jesus said, let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has performed a good service for me. For you always have the poor with you, and you can always show kindness to them whenever you wish but you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for its burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever the good news is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has, been, what she has done will be told in remembrance of her. Okay, not too long. Um, it will take the rest of our time. <laughs> Um, let's start by looking first at the narrative structure of the story, um, the plot, basically. Um, the setting, we'll note, is a meal. 
Jesus is together at a meal in somebody's home, uh, Simon by name. Um, and I think we can fairly assume that this would be a male gathering. That's the, that's the nature of how these meals took place <laughs> in Jesus's day, is that the, the, the genders were not uh, equal partners, you know, at the meal. Uh, there could be women servants, uh, but basically it would be a meal for, um, for men. And so she comes into this um, event, this occasion, and she anoints Jesus's head uh, with nard or perfume, um, a fragrant uh, perfume. That's the single act, uh, the most physical thing that takes place. The rest of the plot uh, flows out of the dialogue. Um, is constructed by that dialogue, and we will separate that out. Uh, first, there is a response. Um, some of those there, they aren't designated precisely who, some there respond in anger to what she has done. And then there is an assessment. They assess, they share their assessment of why they were angry. Um, why has this ointment been wasted? So they characterize what she did as a waste. Um, that's their assessment of the deed. And then they provide a rationale, uh, excuse my abbreviations here, but um, uh, I didn't wanna write too small. Um, they, they share a rationale for their assessment. This ointment could have been sold um, and it amounted to 300 denarii, almost a year's wage. Okay, this ointment could have been sold and given to the poor. This was a radical act that she did, um, and uh, she should not have done it because something much better could have been done. Um, and then they act on their response, on their assessment and rationale by treating her harshly. Some translations say they scolded her, uh, the translation I use there. Now, very soon, Jesus has his own response. He is responding to these some folks who respond in anger. Jesus responds um, by saying, let her alone. Why trouble her? You notice I'm using letters here because biblical scholars, like, like, like li other literary scholars, like to use letters to like show uh, uh, rhyme schemes and things. You know, a sonnet follows certain A, B, B, A, whatever, and C and D and come in there. Um, so this just will help you relate the, the parts of the dialogue here that relate to each other. Jesus has a response as well, and it's to let her alone. Notice that both the sum and um, Jesus ask questions. Uh, first, the, the sum folks who act in anger are responding to the woman's act. Jesus's question uh, questions or responds to that, uh, that response, to that action. Why trouble her? Um, and then Jesus assesses her act differently than they did. They considered a waste. Jesus calls it a good deed or a good service. Now, that is not a generic description of what she did. Jesus is not just generally um, characterizing her deed as something that is good. Good deed or good service is a specific term. Um, um, there were deeds that got you points <laughs> in the synagogue. <laughs> um, there were things that you were spiritually credited for. Um, some things, even though they may have been good, did not qualify, meet those standards of a technical good deed. Um, Jesus describes what she did technically as a good deed. Um, so he's giving it a, a recognized category of behavior uh, according, to, um, according to good Jewish folks. Um, and then Jesus has an opposite rationale to theirs to explain his assessment as a, of a good deed. Um, he says, you always have the poor, and whenever you wish, you can do good to them. You will not always have me. She did what she could. Okay, And here there's a subtle little jab there at the others. 
uh, she did what she could, uh, almost as if to suggest that they're raising an objection that shows that they don't, they themselves don't always do what they can <laughs> um, in doing good to the poor. So that's not their argument that the, that the, that the poor need, uh, are getting neglected. Um, and, and Jesus, and none of the gospels is Jesus one to disassociate himself from the poor. Um, so what uh, Jesus has done is change the contrast in this rationale. The some who react in anger contrast the poor and Jesus. Jesus changes that contrast, not to one of recipient, but to a contrast of opportunity. Um, you always have the opportunity to serve the poor. You don't always have the opportunity to serve me. Um, so then, of course, you probably expected this. <laughs> Jesus also reverses their treatment of her. Uh, whereas they scold her, Jesus says um, that, first of all, he explains that what she has done, this is probably part of C, Jesus explains that part of what she has done as, is to prepare him in advance for his death, to anoint him uh, for burial ahead of time. Um, and he says, because of this, uh, because of what she has done, wherever the gospel is preached, wherever the good news is proclaimed, what she has done will be told in, in remembrance of her. So Jesus honors her instead of scolds her. So you can see what we have in this very short story is, is a, an elaborate um, um, dialogue, an elaborate mental event, an uh, action followed by um, a complete re record of the response to that event. It is complete. It is concise. Um, it's, it's kind of, it has a wholeness to it. You know, everything that, everything that the, the one party does gets responded to by the other party, uh, which is Jesus. Um, next, I would like to um, look at the... Um, the setting a little bit more closely in terms of the language used. Yes, go ahead. Mm -hmm. But still, we don't know her name. No, uh, likewise, and the author does not. The author does not give um, give this woman's name. She is anonymous as a as a character. As are the people who react against her. Um, they are um, anonymous. Hang on to that, okay? Um, somebody wants wants to remember the fact that that since Jesus has predicted um, that she will live on perpetuity, what about that? Okay, okay, good point. Um, we will get there. Uh, I'd like to look at the setting um, and at the language um, that we find describing this setting. What words appeal to your senses? Um, what words appeal to your senses? What words help bring you into this event, into this meal with Jesus and the others and, and the woman? Alabaster. alabaster. Okay. That's, and, and again, I'm not, I don't have too many things made out of alabaster, but I know that it's kind of a precious stone. <laughs> um, and uh, okay. Uh, am I right or wrong? Is it kind of smooth? Okay. Um, okay. At, uh, you might want uh, a jar out of alabaster. Uh, what else? Yes. Mm -hmm. They're assuming that we know who Simon the leper is, so our minds go back to that story. Okay. All right. Um, I'm going to put this um, up here um, to just help you out a bit. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, it's the table of Simon the leper. We'll get to him later, but uh, but no, uh, Mark may have assumed his first audience knew who Simon was, but the rest of us don't. Um, it's not clear uh, who he means. Um, but when when we just mention the table uh, at a meal, what what senses get appealed to there? Ooh, food, food, dinner. Okay, what do you smell? 
<laughs> Hopefully the good smells. All right. Also, the, the word sat is probably closer to reclining. That was the custom in the Roman Empire. So are people tense? Are they behaving their man? No, they're reclined out. Okay. It's a relaxed um, setting. Um, this, um, this alabaster jar that got mentioned, which is something tactile, okay, um, is uh, filled with uh, nard, um, a perfume that was used for money things, including preparation of people for uh, who had a uh, body after it had died, but also had general uses too, particularly in the romantic sphere. I mean, just like today, you sometimes wanted to perfume yourself up when you were with somebody um, that you felt strongly for, had strong feelings for, okay? Now, what, um, what senses come to your mind when you read about the woman pouring the oil or the ointment, the nard, on Jesus's head? Um, you can you smell it, okay? That you get smell that that odor, that fragrance gets very close. Um, again, um, what does it feel like? Of course, I we don't know exactly how horrible this nard was, but it was something that would drip, <laughs> um, it's not like like oil, like olive oil, which was used daily for for cleaning purposes and things like that, and generally considered kind of soothing. Um, today, I don't get all of that excited about just pouring oil um, on, my, on my head. But there was that connotation. You know, when you lived in a dirty, dusty um, climate, um, that, that oil was a considered a very soothing. It was, it was very customary to have somebody, a servant, uh, um, clean your feet um, and maybe even pour oil on your feet when they came to your house as a very hospitable thing to do. Um, yeah. Would it be warm too, or it just be, you know, just feel so good to have something ready to soften? I don't know. Now, I, I like something cool um, <laughs> going on, but, but warm is nice too. So there could be that sensation too, but you're, you're getting the idea, okay? Um, anything else that strikes your senses? Um, okay, let's look at some of the emotions evolved, that some of the words that trigger emotional responses to what has gone on. Um, and uh, okay, first of all, the, 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 the anger that's present there, but the anger may strike us emotionally, particularly because of this setting of relaxation and comfort even, do I, do I dare to put that word comfort up there? Um, um, I, I, I shouldn't have put this up so quickly. You probably would have come up with some of these things. If you were Jesus, you probably felt cared for. Um, right? And even because of the nature of the, the perfume, you could have felt this woman was doing something loving um, uh, and uh, expressing her devotion uh, to Jesus. Um, but this anger that uh, Joan mentioned comes at us too as something discongruent with how the setting makes us feel. A, 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 act, of, a, a act of hospitality and being served a meal and that, that, that devotion and that care given through the anointing um, is, is someplace where anger should not fit. Go ahead. Yes, right, right. And it could be more, it, it could be more shocking or less shocking. Um, um, we don't know precisely. I mean, we don't have quite enough details, but there is that possibility that the people were, their anger started right from the moment she walked in. Right, that possibility. Okay. Now, let's look at some of the symbolism in the language uh, of this story. Any mention of table would make somebody in Mark's audience, most of the people in Mark's audience, um, think of the Eucharist. This is 70 AD for almost 40 years. They have been, every time they gather to worship, they are um, celebrating the Eucharist at the table, you know? Um, so the, even though that's not mentioned here, 
in the back of our minds, we've got to, um, to place that, that the table suggests this ritual act um, of the Eucharist. Uh, the, the Simon's identity, identification as a leper is significant. Um, there's still some question about whether that means he was a leper who was healed. It could be that he had the form of leprosy that uh, was not quite as serious and may not have gotten him socially ostracized. But Mark's inclusion, our author's inclusion of the fact that Simon was a leper is important because people generally kept lepers on the outside. You did not go to a leper's house. So at least people are wondering about, okay, they didn't know Simon. They're wondering about this. Uh, le leprosy was considered, was connected with sin, as was mo most ailments. Um, and a leper was considered unclean. So again, I think we can be safe to assume. And once we look at the whole gospel, we will see that, that uh, Jesus had a certain relationship with people on the outside, like Simon, that other rabbis uh, did not have. Um, now, uh, when the woman breaks open that flask, that triggers something. <laughs> Um, uh, when you go to put a lotion on yourself, you don't usually break the container. Uh, we have screw taps. She did not even have, according to what I've read, a cork stopper, but there had, she had something that, that, that topped off the top, you know, so that it wouldn't spill out. She does not use that. She does not pull that out and dab Jesus with it. Um, she breaks the whole flask. What does that mean? Besides, that's another sensation. That's another sense word. You can hear or feel that even. What does it mean, though, um, symbolically, that she breaks the whole flask? I don't believe that. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Good. We have as uh, skeptics are always welcome. Um, the author tells us that she broke the flask open, and this was sometimes done when you use the contents to anoint somebody who was dead, okay? But at least, at the, at the minimum, at least means she's not intending on using this ointment anywhere else. So it means that her gift to Jesus is a total gift. She's not taking anything back. She has spent it. Um, as, as, as absurd as the amount of oil that was in there, amount of ointment was in there, uh, using that on one person, as absurd as that may be, she has done it. She's not taking her act back. She's not withholding anything. And that uh, may become uh, important. Now, the fact that she pours it on Jesus's head, uh, we've got to look at symbolically because um, that was not usually done <laughs> for a guest. You normally didn't do that in this setting. Anointing the feet or washing the feet may have been more a more socially acceptable act. Uh, pouring ointment on the head was in itself a bit extravagant, and the people with a good knowledge of the scriptures um, would automatically identify her act with kingship or messiahship, because this is how you anointed a king, by pouring oil on his head. Uh, done by a prophet. And this is how you anointed a prophet, by pouring oil, but specifically the Messiah. Uh, the, the word Messiah means the person who has oil poured on his head. That's what the word Messiah or Christ actually means. Um, the person who has been put, has had oil put on their head. Um, and so this, what this woman has done um, automatically at least this is a fairly safe assumption. It's not provable that, that everyone who read this or heard this story uh, or were there at you know, the event necessarily immediately thought of messiahship, but it was very likely. It's very possible. Uh, that's an unmistakable sign. Some people are certain of it, uh, not everyone, but that, that there's a strong suspicion that this is an element that, that the, our author is wanting to underscore that what she has done is not only a good service, a good deed, but it is a prophetic act. 
Um, it is prophetic, at least in Jesus's interpretation. Notice that if that is in the room, that, that connotation of messiahship is in the room, Jesus does not call attention to it. Jesus instead calls attention to what she has done as a preparation for his death and burial. And that will become significant later on. But the other word that, that triggers um, our reaction is that word memorial or in remembrance. Jesus' assessment of what she has done as something worthy of memorial. Now, Jesus is not just saying that wherever the gospel is preached, she will be remembered, that people will recall her. Um, that's not what the word means. It does not even mean she'll have a monument built to her <laughs> to memorialize what she has done. Um, the word used here is a word we cannot find an equivalent for in English. We don't have the same concept. Both Hebrew and Greek have this concept, but English does not have a word to describe this concept. What this word in Greek, it's um, um, nimno, uh, ni and don't even trust my uh, pronunciation, nimosunon. Um, nemosinon, and you can, you can study that and find out we got a lot of words that have to do with memory um, that come from that uh, Greek root. But the, the important thing is, is the word here you, means uh, to take something, not to go back with our mind to the past, but to take something from the past and bring it into the future or into the present. Take something from the past, bring it into the present, and let it live again. Um, uh, in other words, this, what she has done, Jesus intends for that to take on life again in the present. This same word memorial is in, in remembrance is what we find um, in other places <laughs> um, for the last, last supper, not this supper, but the last supper. And when Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me, he's not asking people to recall him or think fondly of him. He's asking people to bring him into their present. And this is what these people did right from the start of, of Christian worship, was to bring Jesus from the past, make him present in the bread in the cup, so that he was with them again. Um, the, 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 the short thing is, is that this is no light response from Jesus. He's not just casually uh, recommending that uh, she ought to be remembered. This is elevating her. There is nobody that we will find in the Gospel of Mark next week who receives as much praise um, as this woman. Right. Yes, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What about the word poor? It's been written in here kind of an economical thing, but could they also find a early family? I'm not a commissioner. It's possible. I, okay, he's wondering whether, whether there is a specific definition of poor um, by, this, by this time or whether. Um, it could be expanded to mean a lot of things. Um, I'm not sure that it does. I think that because of the nature of the term Jesus uses about good service, that was very specific to people who are economically poor. Okay. Don't forget that question, though, because I think we may have opportunity later to, to look at that again in some of the other stories. I want, to, I want to put some of this symbolism, some of these, these language things we've gathered in the context of the frame of the story now. In other words, what happens, uh, we're leaving the story itself, we're looking to happen, what happens just before and just after. And you also have that on your, um, on your handout. It was two days, these are the, the uh, sentences before. It was two days before the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread the chief priests and the scribes were looking for a way to arrest Jesus 
um, by stealth and kill him. For they said, not during the festival, or there may be a riot among the people. Um, and then um, immediately after our event, our story, then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the 12, went to the chief priest in order to betray him to them. When they heard it, they were greatly pleased and promised to give him money. So he began to look for an opportunity to betray him. So our frame shows us something very interesting. Be right before this event, this story, um, there is a plot to kill Jesus. It's mentioned. But there's a problem. They, can't, they don't have all that they need to carry out their plot. There's an obstacle in the way of their plot, to, to the threat to kill uh, Jesus. Immediately afterwards, their solution comes. Now they have a means. Now they have a way. This threat, this plot against Jesus can now take place. And, and from this point on, since Judas and the plotters get together, the action in our gospel accelerates. <laughs> we rapidly move on down to Jesus's crucifixion. Um, but Mark has pulled these apart. Our author has separated these two things. Uh, you see how one flows right into the other? But not here, not in our gospel. There's something been inserted right in between them. Uh, and, and, and look it up in the Gospel of Luke, who also describes this. There's, nothing, there's no story in between. You'll just read right from one to the other. Mark has pulled these apart. When you do that, you put something in, the literary term for it is intercalation. Um, when you put something inside of another story. Um, but all we have time to notice right now or pay attention to the fact is that when you do that, particularly when you have a threat, <laughs> to somebody's life, and then you have the wherewithal that that threat's going to be completed. Um, it creates a dramatic space. Um, this is a charged space dramatically, uh, right in the middle of these two things that, that need to come together for the combustion to take place. Um, so what we find in there is elevated in importance in the whole story. Um, now, uh, I want you to uh, see, notice that, first of all, what, is, what we have in the middle of this threat and the success of the threat, the plot, is a contrasting, a very contrasting event. It's as if it's an oasis in the desert. It's something opposite of what we find in the frame. Instead, we have an act of loving devotion in the setting of hospitality. Um, particularly hospitality on the part of powerless outsiders, the woman and Simon, the, the, the people on the, um, um, on the, in the frame are the people in leadership. They are the powerful. Uh, we have an act by people who, without that power, who present a very opposite uh, situation. I want you to think of it maybe as, as, as the plot, as this big boulder on top of a hill. Um, you know all of the power there. The energy is stored in that rock. Gravity is going to pull that down the hill, and it's going to roll faster and faster and faster. But there is a small rock in front of the boulder wedged up against there that's holding the boulder temporarily in place. The boulder can't go anywhere <laughs> um, until someone comes along with a lever and helps it over this obstacle. The obstacle is the woman's act, this wonderful meal setting. The lever is Judas and his willingness to betray Jesus. Once that rock goes over, there's no stopping it. It rolls on down to its completion. But for a moment, our author has paused that from taking place. Now, um, Mark isn't the only one to use this, but he uses it so much that people refer to an intercalation as a Mark and sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd rather not always be reminded of my hunger when I'm studying things like this, so I, I use the term intercalation. Um, uh, and he was not the only one to use it. It was a device that got used to others, but when I researched it, I could not find any place where it was used as often by one writer or as dramatically, with as much dramatic intensity this, 
until I remembered my study of uh, Shakespeare. <laughs> and so hopefully some of you are familiar with the this, this story of, um, of, uh, of the murder of Duncan uh, in Macbeth. Uh, the very beginning of the plot, you know, we learn that uh, Macbeth has been placed just one step away from kingship. Uh, and the king to celebrate uh, is coming to Macbeth's castle, where, the, uh, where Lady Macbeth and Macbeth are preparing to entertain him and secretly uh, to kill him. Uh, it's an act uh, to scene to that the killing actually does take place. Um, but the discovery does not happen until the end of scene three of act two. Before that, what we have holding those two things apart. See, one just flows right from the other, the killing of Duncan, then the discovery of the killing. And once that discovery is made, the plot of Macbeth rolls down the hill like a boulder, faster and faster. I mean, you can, I can prove that if we had time, uh, how that's in Shakespeare's mind, that time accelerates uh, in this play. But it's held off um, for one moment more. Uh, part, the beginning of, this, of uh, the scene, we find a comic interlude. Uh, with a drunken butler. So uh, uh, instead of a loving act, <laughs> we have, instead of a loving person, anonymous person, we have a drunk but butler. Um, and so he takes his time coming to the door, rambling about this and that, and we hear the knocking. It's in the script, knock, 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 knock. Shakespeare put it there to remind us of what's just about to happen. Uh, but it can't happen yet because this butler's in the way. <laughs> and a, a, a contrast, dramatic tension is created. Um, and then once he even opens the door, and I believe it's Macduff uh, who comes and makes the discovery, but he holds Macduff off for a while talking about alcohol and being drunk, about how alcohol stimulates your desire, <laughs> um, your sexual desire, but then it takes the wit away again. It, it, it's, it's, it creates impotence, okay? Um, so a very body story, uh, but it's doing the same kind of thing. Um, but, um, but the point is that Shakespeare takes advantage of this dramatic situation, this intercalation, because if you look at the drunken butler story, it, it epitomizes in a comedic form, the whole theme of the play. Um, the same thing that gets you excited takes away your power. <laughs> is your doom. The same thing that turns you on will shut you off. And, and for Macbeth, it's the prophecy of the witches who excite him to the idea of becoming king and assure him that he's safe because he won't be killed until the woods come to Dunsinane where his castle will be, okay? Um, um, how can that happen? You know, and uh, he can't be killed by anyone of woman born. I'm safe, except Macduff was, we find out, um, born uh, by his mother, his mother who was dying had to be cut open so he could be pulled from his mother's womb. So the very things that assure Macbeth of his safety spell out his downfall. Um, so I was then intrigued looking, what happened, what about this story? Well, how does Mark take advantage of it? And uh, we find something interesting. The same thing, the central theme, one of the central themes of Mark is there in the woman's act. Um, people had this concept of the Messiah as to being one who would conquer and rule. We'll find out how Jesus' own disciples in Mark are stuck on that notion. The Messiah means someone who's going to come and conquer or rule. Whereas Jesus is trying to preach, present the Messiah is someone who's going to suffer and die. Um, so Jesus' goal is to get rid of that notion. And this story of the woman who anoints him as Messiah, but also as his burial, for his burial, Jesus is able, or the author at least, is able to uh, put these two concepts together the way people weren't. People separated those ideas. A Messiah and King, um, the, the people who wanted to kill him even thought, well, that's why he, you know, he's going to stir up trouble, um, pretending that he's a, a would be a king, um, and uh, and the suffering death. People had those 
apart in their minds. And this act of the woman brings them together symbolically. So the story becomes like a little parable where messiahship is brought together um, uh, with this concept of suffering and death. So that this story is not just a nice little story, not just complete and, and whole, um, but this story is crucially, excruciatingly critical um, to our author. Um, now, and the woman is elevated because of what she does. Now, is that enough to base a theory on, a thesis on? <laughs> um, no. Um, next week, we will put this in the context of the rest of the women of the Gospel of Mark. Um, and so um, there are no requirements for this course, but there's only one expectation, and that's you will have read the Gospel of Mark before next time. It doesn't take that long. Sitting down, reading through, you can do it under an hour. I suggest some ways that you can heighten its impact on you. And one way would be to have somebody good read it to you. And then it might take just a little over an hour. Um, but I do hope that you will get a fresh encounter um, with the Gospel of Mark um, before. The rest of these reading things I'll explain you know, a little bit more next week. They're just in case you want to pursue something. Um, but um, now let's take a time for um, opening of questions. And there was one uh, right over here, and uh, there's a microphone on the way for the sake of these folks. Um, and while they're headed over there, I just want to let you know that you don't currently have anything in chat. And if okay. you're at home on Zoom and would like to type something into chat, feel free to do so, or you can just unmute yourself and ask a question at the appropriate time. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. as, as you were outlining uh, this interlude, uh, mm -hmm. Mm. Pouring out, it's poured out his life. Mm -hmm. uh, which is what Sandra Ray Ruth Gale did. The, the woman then for this question is this comment is that just like the jar is broken in the woman's act, Jesus in his suffering death will be broken um, and poured out as a complete gift. Uh, yeah, that's, that's a very good point. That another reason to elevate this woman is how closely she resembles Christ. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Comments or questions? Yeah. When I said I didn't believe it, that the actually broke open the uh -huh. bottle, but there's an alabaster is a stone. Right. I uh, that's that's something to pursue. Uh, feel free to do it. As I oh, researched it, the um, repeat the, the, the question. Oh yeah, the uh, she is wondering about how you could break open an alabaster jar, um, and maybe it was just a seal. Um, the the jars, most of the jars that would be used for this purpose had a neck but that neck was too th hard to break. However, the body of the jar um, was believed to be fragile enough to break open oh, so that it was not impossible. You don't have to. <laughs> okay. Right. Yep. 
Was this woman uh, Mary um, Magdalene, uh, Mary of Magdala? Uh, and that gets back party to, to Joan's point of view too. Um, I think the safest thing, thing to assume is that uh, since Mark, our author, does not give her a name, we don't. We assume that she, that's not Mary. Now, a lot of scholarship has gone on about this because we wonder whether could you know, Matthew repeats the story pretty much intact uh, from Mark, but Luke and John both have it's Luke where she's Mary of Magdala, and John it's um, it's uh, Martha. The, uh, or is it Mary, sister, Mary, the sister of Martha, okay, the, the sister of Lazarus. Um, so they are using, if it's the same story that they're using, some people say yes, and some people say no, there could have been a different story. If it's the same story, then they are dramatically changing the story because they both have the woman anointing Jesus's feet uh, as a servant uh, would, um, or as a, in, as a penitent woman might. And so instead of a prophet, we have either a friend or a penitent servant. Um, and the safest thing, some believe that, that the story originates with Mark, something that exists out there one way or the other. The important thing is when we're doing this kind of study of Mark, we honor the gospel that we are working with. So uh, yes, it's a question that, that people think about, but um, Mark didn't want us to think about that. <laughs> <laughs> Our author didn't want us to think about that. <laughs> Anything else? Yep. Um, so since Jesus is dinner taking place uh, with the worker, mm -hmm. we assume that these are quarry people. I think, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the woman has a right if she was a woman of means it, it means that she got it through a man somehow <laughs> she was married at one time or whatever most likely um but i have not that's a good question. I've not heard anyone pursue that, um, but um, but yes, and unless she was very good at saving, uh, she had to have some means. It's a it's a part of the story that's there's a lot of the story that that's frankly absurd, and that it could be just part of the absurdity. You look a lot of, at Jesus's parables, and they're also absurd. So it's not such uh, an unusual thing. Um, but uh, yes, it is. It, that's a good thing to notice. Um, that she had some had to have some means if the people who assessed it, its value were correct at uh, 300 denarii. Um, and it wouldn't be there unless our author wanted us to know that that was an extravagant amount of uh, ointment. And so how, how she got that um, being a woman of, of, of without means is, is, is a good question. Um, but what we aren't given a lot, we don't know for sure who this Simon was. We can guess that, that, that Mark's first audience was familiar maybe with someone named Simon that we no longer, we can't identify him with anyone else um, in, the, um, in the gospel records from other gospels. Um, and, and where this woman got her nard, I mean, we'll never know. <laughs> so, yeah. And we, I don't know how, how what shuts down at the, uh, we have just about a minute or two left is by my clock. <laughs> so. Oh my goodness. I was just going to say you have, you have <laughs> plenty of time, but that we have a couple more sessions. So maybe we can uh, take it a little bit longer the next time. Right. Okay. Does anybody at home want to unmute themselves and make a, um, a comment or ask a question. And we have a couple in the room. Great. But we will, we won't go all the way to 2.30. <laughs> so, since nobody's woke up, I will. Uh -huh. um, uh -huh. The title of the course, The Woman Who Wrote the Gospel of Mark, uh -huh. so is this a 
point in session one that you could have you disclose some of your thoughts on that? Um, or we wait to the end? Yes or no. You're going to wait to the end for you wait at least to the last session for my specific thesis, but I won't hold you complete in the dark. I, I am acting, I'm believing um, uh, the, the notion that the gospel is making a statement, a positive statement in, for the role of women, that they belong in the, in the church. And I think that we will see that that much. Uh, it gets really nuanced when we look at the whole gospel. Um, it's more complicated than just this one story. Um, but, but yes, that's where I'm going. Um, that it is my contention that one of the primary purposes of the gospel was to address the situation that women are active in the church or have been from the start. You know, this is around 70 AD. Um, and that position is currently being threatened, right? So, and, and because this woman has the alabaster and here it's a box, but this mm. friend's appointment, she's not really a mere servant. So right. We, we don't, she's anonymous and uh, we're invited to leave her at that. Um, uh, right. Mm -hmm. This whole thing about the, uh, yeah, the, the value of this uh, mm -hmm. uh, appointment. Part of the uh, uh, interrupting the flow of the story as you outlined. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, in keeping with uh, uh, Jesus not uh, uh, not dealing in earthly power and concerns, but in a different realm, uh, this uh, 300 denarian, whatever powerful influence that might buy, mm -hmm. uh, is. Poured out in this act of extravagance, mm -hmm. uh, where maybe it could have been used uh, parallel to uh, uh, purchasing of uh, a Judas services, uh, maybe uh, buy out somebody's uh, servant to get a tip that needs to be out of town. Um, <laughs> the story doesn't go that way. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, the more they've got, mm -hmm. you know, if they use this extravagant uh, mm -hmm. act of worship. Now, what you what this uh, what you're recommending for those of those of you listening, someone has brought up another question about this amount and what else could this amount mean? That this amount, this extravagant amount, is mentioned. Um, could it be drawing a contrast with Judas's uh, payment um, for his betrayal, uh, which does not come amount to nearly as much as what the woman has spent on Jesus? Judas is willing to um to 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 take his act of treachery as opposed to her act of love and devotion jesus is willing to carry out his act of treachery for a much smaller amount um and the other question that was that you raised a possibility that raises is that maybe someone in the back of my their mind i don't think the text supports this necessarily but in the back of their mind is thinking boy we can buy off <laughs> we can buy off these people plotting to, to, to do away with Jesus. That's not, you know, I, I can't tell you, don't ask that kind of question because I had just an absurd question that I am pursuing. So feel free to pursue that. I, I never have, and have not heard anyone else do so, but uh, that does not mean it's not worth pursuing. <laughs> Amateur biblical scholars rule. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if we're wrong, then it's it's still very helpful. It's very useful. It's um, I think it's fun. Maybe not everybody does, but <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. And in fact, since we've since we have finished what we were going to look at, um, we can step outside of the gospel. It's permissible to do as long as you first address what you have. 
Okay, and stepping outside, um, other evangelists do make that connection, and I'm forgetting whether it's Luke or John, between uh, the person who raises the objection about the cost with Judas. Um, um, so, so, so yes, and there is that reason for them to do so. Um, but uh, again, for our purposes here, um, um, we need to look at why the author did not choose to do that. Um, in other words, leaving these people who get angry, they're not even identified as disciples, um, and leave particularly the person who raises the question about the, the cost, leaving that open um, allows um, our evangelist to, to put a lot more people in that position than what, uh, what, what would be the case if they are identified. Um, so, and um, uh, maybe one more here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. Okay. Does anybody have any questions about anything on the second page? Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Why are we stopping at 16? 16.8. Oh, a very good question. <laughs> um, um, 16.8 is the end of the gospel. Um, so if you're reading a copy, and you can use any translation you want, even a paraphrase like living or or the message is okay for this doing through the whole gospel. If you study something in depth, you need something a little bit more precise, uh, like a translation. Um, but I'm not saying that the others, the paraphrases don't have benefit too. Um, but um, if your translation uh, does not have uh, the gospel ending at 16.8, then it is in error. Okay, that much I can state for fact. Everybody accepts that now as fact. Um, um, because uh, it, those other endings that sometimes get tacked on there didn't appear for, for, again, for I don't know how long exactly, but one of them at least, not until the, the, the fourth century. Um, so it was, it was people's reaction to the abrupt ending at 16.8 that caused them to add things on. But the earliest, the earliest texts do not have it. Um, so there is evidence that those additions that you see, anything you see after 16.8 is not by, oh, you don't, you don't even need the, the scholars to tell you that because you just read that and it's a completely different style of writing. This is definitely not our author. Our author stopped at 16.8. And for a long time, we thought maybe that's because the last page got lost somewhere. <laughs> um, the last papyrus usually, and I'm forgetting um, what form that it would have been written on, but um, um, that's technically probably possible, but hardly anyone believes that. More people have found a reason for ending, not a comfortable one, but uh, a reason that to believe that that's where our author wanted to stop. So that would be one thing we address starting next week, but also will be critical in my thesis <laughs> come the third time, the third day. So um, yeah, that's, and, and, and ask yourself questions about how, do, how does that make me feel when you're reading through this gospel or having it read to you, um, how does it make you feel when it ends at uh, verse eight of uh, chapter 16? Thank you. So yes. Figured it out. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So stories happen that way. First, mm -hmm. it's a very narrow type story, and then pretty soon people um, have learned more about it or heard something mm -hmm. about it. Okay. The question was: Is it possible that 
the, the later accounts after Mark that include names in the story, for example, or, or other details, could they have learned something um, about the story more than, than Mark had access to or our th author had access to? And that's a, that's a very good question to raise. It's something to think about if, for what it's worth. Um, we generally, that's <laughs> <so> over here, <laughs> um, we generally don't think that's how things work. It, it makes more sense to believe that the simplest form of the story is the most original and that the details uh, got added for some other reason than finding, oh, here's more of the story. Um, yeah, it's, it's um, and I would, and I could be wrong, I would tend to agree that it is, it, it makes more sense when you're looking at how these gospels got put together to think that, oh, here's how I can enrich the story. Here's how I can, uh, here's how I can connect I can get this family of, of um, Lazarus and Mary and Martha can bring them in again. Okay. To my mind, that makes more sense. Um, you don't have to believe that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, I did a little research on that a while ago. And I have to believe that for all things except for one, the very oldest one that was true. Mm. And when it was found, it was pre revolutionary. Mm. Mm -hmm. And this referred to what text? Okay, right. Yeah, and I, um, right. But I don't think that they need to, yeah. Oh, oh, he's raised a question about um, our, our assuredness that the other things are later, and he brought up carbon dating. Um, and you read something about how that was, that was proven, but there, and it, that could very well be. Uh, at the same time, there are a lot of um, a lot of ways. Other besides carbon dating, you can tell um, that something that doesn't appear for a hundred years <laughs> didn't exist before. Um, either references to something. Um, again, that's that's where it takes you know a professional. I think that we we need to be thankful for the people who are taking that question kind of question and and just. Making making sure all the eyes are dotted and, and whenever that we're safe in our assumptions. Um, yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. It may not be the best. <laughs> Make but... sure you re repeat what they said. Oh, yes. Um, thank you very much. I'm finding two things hard. <laughs> Keep keeping my mind set on where our time schedule is. And also this, uh, even though I know that, I got to repeat the questions. Um, the, uh, the statement was about um, possible um, uh, proof of the, um, the age, but also um, of a text, but also taking the circumstances of the time. And that comes in, it does, we have, don't have to do that immediately when we're looking at a gospel, but eventually we'll find ourselves wanting to do that uh, when we look at a purpose, particularly on the third day. Uh, we'll want to look at what's going on. And one of the things that was going on was this big conflict with Rome. And in 70 AD, Rome sacked uh, Jerusalem. And uh, it, it was, everybody's faith was kind of in crisis. So um, to, if you're interested more in that, how this may have affected Mark in particular, um, the book I have on the list from um, uh, Werner Kelber, uh, The Story of Jesus, would be the, the one that addresses that the most. There are others too. If you want to read a big long one, then there's one that's a big fat book on Mark by Ched Myers uh, called Binding the Strongman, who deals, as far as I know, most the most with um, uh, Rome, uh, Jesus and Rome in the Gospel of Mark. Um, 
but there are a lot of other theories. Some of them we may mention uh, by the third day. Uh, and if, uh, if, uh, if my planning has worked out the same way, we'll have some time, a whole extra half hour <laughs> to, uh, to get into some of those questions, but not yet. <laughs> and don't even think about those. If, and this is like telling someone not to think of an elephant, but um, <laughs> don't think about those when you read through the gospel. Let it hit you fresh. Use a fresh translation if you can. Um, and um, if possible, to read it more than once, don't even think about the role of women in the Gospel of Mark. <laughs> um, I know you can't do that, but um, if you can read it twice, save that for the second time. That's ideal. We can't be ideal in a three session class, but um, just a thought. Okay, thank you very much for all of your thoughts and for your interest and your attention. Have a good afternoon. And uh, I am glad in the end that we can give the staff here uh, 15 extra minutes <laughs> to get ready because they do a lot of work to make these happen both here and um, via Zoom. Thanks again. Right. Well, thank you so much. You're getting a lot of applause from the people at home as well. Yeah. We appreciate it. Everyone have a great afternoon. <laughs>